All right. So I think that's where we stopped that time. Okay. Um, so what happens when we deprive ourselves of sleep? And we um, mentioned a few points when we ended last lecture. Um, so we're going to continue with that. Um, uh, so other the, the things we mentioned at the end of the last lecture, um, when you are deprived of sleep for some time, when you go back to sleep, you go through what's called sleep recovery, where you try to make up the sleep that was lost. So your brain actually remembers, keeps an account of how much REM sleep you lost, of how much deep sleep you lost, and tries to recover that. So for example, they did this with this um, guy where they kept him up for 11 days straight, and they looked at his sleep, pa yeah, his sleep pattern uh, when he was allowed to go to sleep. And what they noticed was that the first night, he overslept. He just slept many more hours. And not, not only did the number of hours increase, but also a particular stage, stage three, also increased. Does anybody remember stage three? Is that slow wave? Is that run sleep? What is that? Huh? Delta waves. Delta waves, yes. Okay. Um, the second night, he tried to uh, make up his REM sleep, um, and if we look at the distribution, at about one week, after about one week on the eighth night, the distribution of the different stages, the number of hours that he went to sleep, was pretty much back to normal. Okay? But sleep deprivation, where you don't get any sleep at all, that can actually be fatal. So when you, uh, in experiments, when we forced animals to go to sleep, to be sleep deprived, they actually died. And in fact, sleep deprivation is used as a torture method. Okay? Um, there's an actual uh, disease that's called fatal familial insomnia that is genetic and it's inherited where the person develops this where they completely lose the ability to go to sleep and they just they end up dying after this develops maybe half a year to 24 months, two years after that, after the onset of that disease. Because you, we, till this day, we, can't, we haven't found anybody who can live without completely no sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Although that would be nice. Yeah. It's like sleeping pills are an option for them, or does that just not? No, it's a genetic disorder that's inherited. Uh, and plus, you can't live on sleep uh, pills forever. And we're going to end the lecture with that today. Uh, but... Uh, no, so it's a genetic disorder basically, and it, uh, the bad part about this is, is the onset of this genetic disorder starts about midlife, when people have had their kids, they have found their career, you know, they're pretty successful, they're pretty set, and then they develop this disease and basically they die half a year to two years after the onset of the disease. Okay, so why is it so important? What are the functions of sleep? Um, so here are a few functions, of course there are many more. Um, one is to conserve energy. So basically, you, uh, you close your computer, you close your brain, you shut down your brain, although not really. We're going to find out that your, sleep, your brain actually doesn't go to sleep. Um, also, to conform to your niche, your environment, um, to restore your body, and for memory consolidation. And we're going to go through each of these ones in a separate slide. Okay, conserving energy, so uh, reduced muscle tension. We talked about during REM sleep, you're actually paralyzed. Okay, so, so that saves up a little bit of muscle, on muscle tension. Your heart rate slows down, your temperature goes down, uh, your respiration is reduced. So all of this saves up on your metabolic activity that was used up during the day. Okay? Now, the smaller the animal, the smaller the mammal, the higher the metabolic rate. And the higher the metabolic rate, the more time they need actually asleep. Okay? Unless they, they sleep in open fields, so for example, horses, they sleep in open fields, they can't afford to sleep many hours because they will be attacked because they're sleeping in open fields. So they tend to sleep maybe 3.9 hours. Yes? So horses in captivity, they sleep on them? That are like far yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that their sleep uh, will be affected by that. But just when an animal sleeps in open field, that makes them sleep less, um, so they can basically protect themselves. Okay. They don't, do they don't have the same thing like the birds, whatever, where one side works at a time? And no, side. no, not that I know of. No, okay. horses don't do that. No. Are you talking about like overall sleep, or is it like shorter periods of sleep? No, no, no. They're, they're like 3.9 hour block of sleep. Okay, um, the second function we talked about that it enforces kind of like adaptation and conforming to an environmental niche that the animal is a part of. 
So you have nocturnal animals and diurnal animals, animals that sleep at night, uh, that sleep, sorry, during the day and wake up at night, animals that sleep um, uh, at night time and wake up during the day. Um, so conforming to that niche. So for example, um, these bats here, that's how they sleep, these little babies. Inside, this is a leaf, and they actually take the leaf and they cover themselves with it. Okay? So it kind of helps them conform to their niche. They're very cute. I never thought I'd say that they're cute, but they do look cute. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. It also restores um, the body. So all the proteins, all the energy that we use to make proteins, it takes time to make these proteins. So when you go to sleep, it's a chance to restore some of these proteins that were used up during uh, wakefulness. Also, some of uh, impo the important hormones, like growth hormones, are released during slow wave sleep. Okay. So um, as we get older, and I don't know if we mentioned this already or not, but as we get older, we get less and less deep sleep, or less and less slow wave sleep, and thus less growth hormone is being released. Children who are deprived of um, sleeping long enough, where they don't <coughs> get enough slow wave sleep, they're, not, uh, they're also getting less growth hormone being released, and thus can be smaller. Okay. So slow wave sleep is really, really important. Um, you need to sleep long enough to get enough slow wave sleep in there to get the growth hormone being released. Okay, also proper sleep, and we mentioned this before, is very important for the immune system, and sleep deprivation um, will lead to some immune problems and getting sick more often. People who sleep six hours or less per night are actually more likely to die within the next um, six years. Like, it's serious when, I, when sleep deprivation is not to be taken lightly. People who sleep less than five hours per night are more likely to develop things like diabetes, for example. Okay? Um, so the, rule, the general rule is what has been shown in research, the less hours if you sleep, you sleep not yet per night. If you do that consistently, you die younger. It's kind of like, I think it's kind of like you are born with a set number of wakefulness hours. If you use them up very quickly because, I don't know, you're on cocaine, you're on speed, you don't sleep, you use them up quickly and you die earlier. Okay. And sleep is extremely important for memory consolidation. Okay. So maybe you've been through this before where you studied for a test, you tried to memorize something, and you go to sleep and you're like freaking out. You're like, oh my God, I can't get this. I'm never going to memorize this. It's never going to get into my head. You go to sleep, you wake up, and it's in your head. And you do your test and the information somehow is in there. Well, what happens when you study and then you go to sleep, so there's no, you're not watching TV after, you're not going to, you know, doing some other activities, that the sleeping right after gives you a chance to continue studying when you're sleeping. Like the brain will actually continue the activation um, to help this information get consolidated. And on the contrary, if you don't get enough sleep, this information doesn't get a chance to consolidate. And that's why I'm so against all-nighters. Because it actually affects your memory consolidation badly. Um, okay, and this type of sleep or memory consolidation is not the same one as getting um, a blackout or like when you drink a lot of alcohol and you just pass out. It's not the same thing. Because what happens when that happens when you wake up? Do you remember anything? No. no. You remember nothing. <clears throat> and that's because you were deprived of sleep. That's not considered sleep. Okay? That, yes? Um, how many hours do you need of sleep for that memory consolidation? Well, so everybody's a little different. I mean, research has it, you know, right around eight hours, but people oh. might differ. But certainly getting six or five hours is not enough. Okay, uh, but, uh, but really sleep is so important for memory consolidation. Okay. Like tons of research showing that. And you need both parts of sleep. You need REM sleep and you, know, you need deep sleep, slow wave sleep. Both are going to be important because both contribute to different types of memories. Okay, so both are going to contribute to different types of memories. For example, perceptual skill learning, uh, declarative, like the kind of information you're learning right now that would be considered declarative memory, like factual information. Um, complicated motor skills, so all of that stuff is going to get consolidated during the different stages of sleep. Okay, um, now there are these r rare anomalous cases. They're certainly not 
um, normal, uh, where you have people who live long enough and they seem to be normal and fine, like this nurse here who's 80 years old who only sleeps or needs one hour of sleep a day. And she's functional and she's fine. Now, like I said, it's not something like I'm going to train myself to only sleep one hour. You can't do that. There's probably some genetic tendencies to make someone need <coughs> more or less hours of sleep. Uh, but until this day, we have not found someone that completely can go without sleep at all and live. Okay? So here's her picture. Taking care of this little boy. Okay, does that make sense so far? Okay. Now let's see what happens in your brain when you're sleeping. Because your brain is actually not sleeping when you're sleeping. It's actually pretty active. There's tons of stuff going on. Um, so we're going to see how sleep and wakefulness and dreams are mediated by these four systems here. The forebrain system, the brainstem system, the pontine system, and the hypothalamic system. And we're going to go into each one in detail. So what we know from transaction experiments, where we basically isolate a certain part of the brain from another, when we, tr when we have an isolated brain, where we separate the brain from the spinal cord, the brain is sh can show signs of sleep and wakefulness just fine. So we know that sleep, wakefulness, dreams is a property of the brain. It can do that in its own. It doesn't need to be connected to any other parts. Okay. So how about when we isolate just the forebrain? Okay, so we kind of uh, make an uh, incision, separate the rest of the brain from the forebrain. What would happen? What kind of electrical activity would we see? Well, it turns out when we do that, that the electrical activity in the brain, in the forebrain, excuse me, shows constant, constant, slow wave sleep with no other stages. And if left like that, if, the, if it's up to the forebrain, it will stay in constant slow wave sleep forever. Okay, so we know that the first system that was mentioned a couple of slides ago, the forebrain system, is important for generating slow wave sleep. What Christina mentioned earlier, delta waves. Okay? Okay, so... This is indicative, this dash line here is indicative of uh, an incision to separate the forebrain from the rest of the brain. And what you see when you look at electrical activity, you see slow wave activations, um, i.e. delta waves. <coughs> okay, what causes, what exactly causes the slow wave activations in the forebrain? Well, a nucleus in the forebrain, in the basal forebrain, so basal is kind of, here, if you were looking here between my eyes and if my forehead was kind of see-through, that's what I mean by basal forebrain. It's like the, the, the floor, if you will, if you were looking through right through here. There's a small uh, a nucleus there called the basal nucleus um, that when activated, neurons there when activated, um, they release GABA. And if you remember from previous uh, lectures, GABA is what? Inhibitory or excitatory? Inhibitory. 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 Exactly. It's the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. So when these neurons in the basal forebrain become activated, um, they then activate uh, receptors in a nearby area called the tubermammillary nucleus that happens to be in the back or the posterior hypothalamus. <coughs> The system here is what causes um, slow wave sleep. And the system here, we can take advantage of it to put someone under general anesthesia. Okay? And if not stopped, the person would live in that forever. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So that was the first system. The second system is called the reticular formation. The reticular formation are basically branches, is a web of branches or axons that go up and that go down. We're only going to talk about the ascending part, the part that's going up, because the descending one, the one that's going to the spinal cord, does motor stuff. We're not going to care about that for today. The ascending part is going to be really important for basically waking up the brain. So if we stimulate 
the reticular formation, these axons that are going up, these ascending axons, the animal immediately will wake up. Immediately. If we sever or lesion the reticular formation, this web of axons, the animal can go into constant or complete coma. Okay, and they've done these uh, um, experiments in cats. Okay, where you actually stimulate, you see the cat, the cat immediately wake up. Um, okay, so there has to be a balance between the forebrain system and its GABAergic neurons, these inhibitory neurons, that makes you go into deep sleep, and the reticular formation that guides the brain to go into wakefulness from slow wave sleep. Okay, and we'll, we'll, the fourth system is going to shed some light on how this balance is established. Okay, the third system, or the pontine system, it's called the pontine because it's going to involve an area in the pons, right? That's why it's called the pontine, which is going to be, um, the pons contains this nucleus called the locus ceruleus, um, and right next to it, um, there is an area there that's responsible for making the person go into REM sleep. So we already talked about an area, the forebrain system, that's responsible for slow wave sleep, we talked about the um, reticular activation or formation um, <coughs> system that's responsible for shifting from slow wave sleep to wakefulness. And now we're left with REM sleep. What, what, how does that happen? And that's because of the pons or a nucleus um, that's uh, in the pons near to the locus ceruleus, which makes the person go into an active REM sleep. How does it do that? Well, it inhibits via, again, the main inhibitory neurotransmitter, GABA, in addition to another um, inhibitory neurotransmitter called glycine, um, it, it, uh, um, it inhibits the motor cortex, the motor cortex, um, while the person is in REM sleep. And why do you think that's a good thing, that there's a mechanism from the brainstem, to be more specific, the pons, that inhibits or sends messages to the motor cortex to inhibit movement or the motor cortex? Why, why would that be a good thing? Or, or not. So you don't walk in your sleep. Exactly. So you don't act out your sleep. So the people who do act out their sleep or walk in their sleep. People who act out their dream might have, a, yes, a problem with that system. Okay, so the brainstem, <coughs> or more specifically the pons, sends out inhibitory messages to the motor cortex to quiet the motor cortex. So the, so the person is not compelled to act out their dreams, although that would be fun. <laughs> but, um, yeah, not for the person. Okay, so actually lesions in that area will have, uh, because of genetic, genetically or whatever, a lesion because you're doing an experiment in an animal, will have the animal act out their dream. Yes, for okay. example, this cat here is acting out her dreams. Yes. Is this the same thing for people who talk in their sleep? No, it's a little different. Yeah. Well, I, think, I don't think my son has this thing because he punches me in the sleep all the time. That's, diff that's also a little different. And people, kids, uh, by the way, kids can do that. Kids can kick when they're sleeping. They can be pretty aggressive when they sleep. Okay, not you, Adam. They box when they sleep. Huh? They box when they sleep. We don't give out family secrets. Uh, I'll take notes. Uh, okay. Uh, now, the force system and kind of like the master system that coordinates all of this and the movement among the stages is what's called, uh, uh, sorry, um, has been discovered because of patients who suffer from narcolepsy. Does anybody know what narcolepsy is or know someone who suffers from narcolepsy? Yes. It's when you just fall asleep. Yeah, exactly. Is that you get these attacks of sleep, and by the way, it's not because you're bored. You can be doing the most interest. I mean, like the most interesting thing in life and fall asleep. <laughs> okay, yes. My grandmother had narcolepsy, and she really passionate about politics. So we would have talks, and she'd get really, you know, fired up about politics, and we'd look over and look back at her, and she'd be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, not, it's not a sign that the person is bored or anything like that. They just sleep. How long are they out for normally? It depends. It depends. But um, if they wake up in a state of REM sleep, what's happening in REM sleep? They're supposed to be paralyzed. They're paralyzed. So they wake up in a state of disorientation, right? They don't know where they are. They're paralyzed. Like, they, you think they're dead. It's pretty scary for someone who doesn't know what's going on. 
And if they're driving, if you're not coleptic, it's not a good idea to drive. <laughs> At least not in Huntington Beach. Yes. When I was little, um, we were at a playground and we were playing on a jungle gym like this little boy and me and like a few other kids. And suddenly, like, I was talking to him and then like I see his eyes close and he just drops. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm like, ah! His mom comes over, oh, he's not epileptic. <laughs> 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 my mom had a big, long talk. <laughs> yeah, that could happen. I, I remember uh, being woken up while I was in the barracks. Uh, I guess I was in the rim. I couldn't move for the life of me. I just had my NCO just yelling at me, like slapping me. I'm just like, oh. Yeah, yeah. You, if you wake up in REM sleep, the same thing when you wake up from REM sleep, for, the, for a few seconds you're disoriented. You want to get up, but you can't get up. We've all experienced that. Okay? Um, so uh, this is, it has a serious genetic component to it, um, and this, this lack of movement is some, it's called catalepsy, okay? which you have a loss of, of, of um, uh, motor tone. Okay. Um, yes? No, it's actually not that common. No, it's not, it's not that common. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, by studying narcoleptic patients, we know that they have a serious problem or mutation in a gene for uh, a, a protein <coughs> called um, hypoprotein um, receptor or the orexin. Okay, so we know because of these patients that hypocretin, is what's responsible for the transition between wakefulness directly into REM sleep. It prevents a person from going from being awake to REM sleep. So if you remember when we talked about the stages of sleep, does a person go from being awake to REM sleep or do things happen before that? Things happen before. Exactly. The person goes through so, uh, you know, stage one, two, but that's not important. The person goes through slow wave sleep and then REM sleep. With cataleptic patients, that doesn't happen. They can fall right into REM sleep. Okay, and we know that's because they have the cells that we, uh, uh, or the genetic, uh, there's a, they have a genetic mutation that for the hypocretin gene, and that's um, but largely responsible for the catalepsy, okay, um, or the nar uh, narcolepsy. Um, humans with narcolepsy, listen to this, lost about 90%, that's almost like all, of their hypocretin neurons. That's, that's a lot. Okay, but this shed light on the fact that we do have this fourth system that's responsible for inhibiting the direct transition from being awake to REM sleep. Okay. Okay, where are these hypocretin neurons? They're in the hypothalamus. And that brings us back to that earlier slide that lists the fourth system with the fourth system being the hypothalamic system that kind of is the master and that controls the other uh, uh, one, two, and three systems, okay? So this hypothalamic system is going to project to the other centers that we talked about, <coughs> the forebrain, the basal forebrain, that's responsible for SWF, or slow wave, the reticular formation, which is res responsible for waking you up, the Ponkin system, or the locus cerealis, which is responsible for bringing you into one sleep, okay? Um, so the axons uh, that go to the tuber mammillary nucleus, remember the GABAergic neurons from the basal forebrain that go to the posterior hypothalamus, or more specifically the tuber mammillary nucleus. Um, it, this inhibition um, of this pathway from the forebrain is going to induce um, slow wave sleep. So again, the hypocretin neurons or this hypothalamic system is going to control the transition or the balance between wakefulness, slow wave sleep, and REM sleep. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is a dog that is um, narcoleptic. Okay. Um, this is a slide that sums up the last, I don't know, 10 slides that is extremely, extremely important. If you understand the slide, you understand the pre the, all the four system, it's like, it, you should know the slide like the back of your hand. Which actually, I don't know why people say like the back of your hand, because I don't know the back of your hand, but yeah. I don't know. Know it like something that you know really well. Okay? Okay, so again, here is the four brain system in that yellow area that's going to be responsible for slow wave sleep. 
How is it going to do that? By releasing GABA, which is inhibitory. What is it inhibiting? It's inhibiting the tuberal mammillary nucleus in the hypothalamus. The brain stem area, um, uh, the reticular formation that's going through that area, is going to be responsible for waking up the person. The locus cerealis in the pontine or the pond is going to be responsible for moving the person into REM sleep. Okay, and then what's going to coordinate all of this are the hypocretin uh, um, neurons that are found in the post um, hypothalamic area. Okay, so remember when I was saying narcoleptic patients, all on the left side, on this slide here, um, all the dark spots are hypocretin neurons in normal people. Narcoleptic patients, what do you notice? Are there any dark spots? That's because, yeah, that's because there is, they have almost no hypocretin neurons, a loss of 90%, causing the narcolepsy. The, these, uh, the, so this is something that stains for the neurons that release the hypocretin, or that have the hypocretin. There's nothing that that, I think pretty much not. Yeah, that not, I don't think there's a treatment for narcolepsy, um, mm -hmm. other than being extra cautious. You probably have to get some stimulants to wake you up, uh, but it, is, it does have a big genetic component. Sleep paralysis is this inability to move right before falling asleep or when you first wake up, okay? And this could be caused by, remember the pontine system that sends information to the motor cortex to inhibit it so you don't act out your dream? So maybe if you wake up while the pontine system continues to send these signals, you try to get up, but you can't. So is it maybe more common in like, um, like sudden like being interrupted from sleep, like in a, in, a, in a sudden way? Well, if you happen to wake up while well, this message signal is still going on, where the motor cortex is inhibited, you're not going to be able to get up. So even if it's not interrupted sleep, where it's not sudden interruption, but you just happen to wake up in REM sleep or while the pontine system continues to send these messages, you're not going to be able to move your muscles. Yeah? Is it bad? I have ha that happened to me quite a bit. Okay. What about like a return to sleep? <laughs> uh, we, uh, we, we tend to actually overestimate our inability to fall asleep and certain things. Yeah. So we, you might be overestimating just a bit. Um, but that, that's, it's not uncommon. Yeah. yeah. So is it just a stroke of chance that you go and um, so it's, it's not, no, it's not really a chance. It's any time you wake up while these pon the, the pons is sending messages to inhibit the motor cortex, or let's say you're in REM sleep, your vessels are going to be mar paralyzed. Yeah. What I'm saying is the, the, the chance that you wake up while it mm, uh, Yeah, I guess you could say chance. So if you happen to wake up in, in sleep paralysis, um, is there just like a certain amount of time that you have to wait before you can start moving, or can you like will yourself into? No, you can't will yourself. If I've you're done it though. I've done it. I I no, <laughs> no, if your muscles are paralyzed, <laughs> if your muscles are paralyzed, they're paralyzed. It, I've been like move, and then when I did it hard enough, I like was able to move. But but that's probably because that signal has stopped. What? <laughs> you <laughs> so me. And then there was a question over there. I think. No. Oh, yeah. Is that kind of like saying like your, your leg fell asleep or your arm fell asleep? No, it's a little different because the, the, your, your actual muscles are paralyzed. Okay? So it's like you, it, it would be very difficult for me to believe that you can willfully just move a paralyzed muscle. I don't know. Well, that's it's not like saying that you like, slept too hard on your leg or something. No, different. that's a little different. Yeah. Yeah. You've never woken up from sleep where you really feel disoriented and you can't get up? No? Okay, that can happen. I'm pretty good sleeper. <laughs> okay, uh, sleep disorders in children. Um, night terrors are actually common in children. And night terrors um, don't happen unlike what most people think. They don't happen during REM sleep. They don't happen during the typical dream stage. They actually happen outside that during slow wave sleep. Okay, when the person is deeply in sleep or the child. And although it's really scary for parents because their child is screaming, um, it's really not that scary. 
because the kid remembers nothing the next day. Okay? Um, and it typically happens in the earlier part of the night than the later part of the night. Um, so if you are going to leave the child with the babysitter or something, if you're leaving in the later part of the night, the chances of the night terrors happening slim down. Okay? Um, okay. Sonambulism. Um, so the first part of the word means sleep. The second part, ambulism, means movement. So this means sleepwalking. Sleepwalking also happens during the third stage or slow wave sleep as well. Okay? And this is something that can actually persist into adulthood. Okay. Now, um, recently in the news, uh, there was an article on um, people who sleepwalk, but ones that were this developed after 50, like later on in life, and how that actually can proceed more serious degenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease. Okay. It actually can proceed more um, um, debilitating motor, uh, motor dysfunctions like the ones found in Parkinson's disease. <coughs> um, run sleep behavior disorder. Dis do you have a question? Um, yeah, about sleepwalking. Uh -huh. um, are the people's eyes closed when they're sleepwalking? I think they are, yeah. So if they run into something, do they wake up? I don't think they do. So I, a friend of a friend, I remember that every time her boyfriend heard like a truck go by the house, he would run to the window and want to throw himself from the window when he's sleeping. Oh my um, so yeah, so sleep, I mean, it could be dangerous. I don't know. I didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> Very thoughtful though. Yeah. My uh, little sister sleepwalks and it's partially you can see the eye, but they're not like there. No, they're definitely not there. They're completely disoriented. Definitely not there. Yeah. So how can you, but it's can you like, wake them up? Or no. You don't want them. You don't want them. It'd be very them. difficult to wake them up. Yeah. Okay, no, but you, you would just want to make sure that the, you know, the, the door is locked. You want to make sure that the house is safe. So if somebody does have this. I mean, this does happen to children. It's not uncommon. Okay, and it can persist during adulthood. Um, but like I said, if it's something new and it develops after like 50 when a person is older, that's not good news because it could mean that another more serious debilitating thing like Parkinson's disease might actually develop. Okay, um, okay. Uh, RUM behavior disorder is the person when they're sleeping, they start to act out in a very organized way. Okay, um, okay and here we go. If a person has acts out their dreams or walks when they're sleeping, and this starts after. Now, I, I can't emphasize this. So if you're young and you're doing this, not a big deal. But if you begin this after age 50 where you act out your dream or you walk, this actually could be bad news because it could be something that proceeds um, or, or a bad introduction to something like Parkinson's disease and dementia. So if you have a grandmother or a grandfather that's starting to do that, um, you might want to take it seriously and see what's going on. Okay? Yeah. When you say act out, do you mean Sleepwalking? Sleepwalking, we're actually acting out their dreams. Oh, okay. Where they're not just like twitching. You know how when you're sleeping, yeah. that's very normal to twitch? We talked about that, like twitching or facial twitching or something, or spasms or something. That's, we all do that. That's normal. But where they have organized behaviors as though they're acting out their dreams or they're walking and they started this after 50, uh, you, you want to take that seriously, like really seriously, because it, it's, um, it could be something that's preceding a dementia or Parkinson's disease. Okay, because it could be an indication of some damage to the motor system, which is the cardinal symptom of something like Parkinson's disease. Okay, um, sleep onset insomnia is the person has a problem falling asleep, starting sleep. Okay, and this could be because of many fa factors. It could be genetic, but it also could be because of the person is working a night shift. It could be because of stress. It could be because of jet lagging, many, many things. Okay, um, sleep maintenance insomnia is a person has a problem maintaining a sleep. So, for example, people um, uh, who are depressed might go to sleep, which is fine, but they would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and call it the night. And they're like, okay, I've been awake. I waited one hour, so it's not too early to call you. What are you doing? <laughs> okay. Um, Talking from experience? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, not, 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 not fun. <laughs> um, okay, 
Um, and also, if somebody's doing drugs or taking drugs, that can also have problems for maintaining the sleep. Yep. So. That second one I definitely have. Is it because what they gave me in the military with the my I'm glad you don't have my number. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I just lie there. Is it something, because they used to give me ambient. I told you all that crazy stuff they used to give me. <laughs> Could it be why I can't stay asleep because of the stuff they give me? Uh, it could be, well, I, I don't know if that stays in your system to link, because I don't know all the drugs that you've taken, but certainly if you are... Um, <laughs> it was military, I think God, chill out. And I did not mean that kind of thing. <laughs> um, okay, but it, it, I, I don't, like, taking medications, it could be just a normal medication um, that's not in the military or not, like a neurological medication, actually can affect the ability to maintain a sleep. And also other kind of de um, dementia disorders. So people who have Parkinson's disease might also have problems with maintenance of sleep. People who have depression have a problem with maintaining a sleep. So it could be a whole host of things. People who are anxious or stressed might have a problem maintaining a sleep. Okay. Uh, but again, um, as we said a few slides ago, that it's important that the person gets a full sleep with all the stages in them, uh, REM sleep and slow wave sleep, because that's important for all, all the things we talked about. Okay, sleep apnea, A means without, nia means breathing. Sleep apnea is when you actually stop breathing when you're sleeping. Okay, if you know somebody, and particularly a male who's overweight, um, who wakes up and even though they slept 10, 12 hours, they're very irritable and um, um, very irritable. You can't really get along with them, even though they had enough sleep and they feel sleepy and they <coughs> want to take naps, even though they had enough sleep. They might want to, you might want, want to take them to a sleep clinic to see if they have sleep apnea. That's all they do. Okay? Yes? Can this occur in children? Yeah. Yeah. Especially overweight. Okay? But the solution for this is really, it's, it's actually very much, well, I don't want to say very much available because depending on your insurance, but it's a, you sleep with a machine that helps you, um, I mean, the machine looks scary and the person doesn't look exactly attractive. Um, but it's, you sleep with the machine, <laughs> it helps you get rid of the apnea um, and all other activities, um, so you can breathe better. Okay, but it's actually, it's very scary, because if you have a high blood pressure, if you have a cardiac problem and you stop breathing, that's a lot of work on your brain and on your heart. Um, you can actually die. So this is, not, although it seems benign, it's not. You're, some people can start, wait, they go to a sleep clinic and they discover that they've stopped sleeping 500 times. Now, because every time you go, you fall asleep, you don't remember the time, how, it, how long it took you to fall asleep. You don't remember that the next day. So you don't remember like, oh, I woke up 500 times yesterday. You don't remember that. But if you are, your partner is like gasping for <coughs> air uh, when they're sleeping because they stopped breathing and they're trying to get air. Um, if, if someone is irritable the next day and they, even though they had like 10 hours of sleep, they still, they still need naps throughout the day. Um, I, I would definitely uh, take him to a sleep clinic. I would bet everything I have, all the ten dollars in the bank, that <laughs> they have sleep apnea. And it's mainly in overweight people. Uh, I, I mean, it, typically overweight males, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen in, in people who are not overweight and females. And how common in newborns? Newborns, like newborns to six months. I, uh, I don't think it's. I wouldn't say it's that common. But in, in, in newborns where you have a, a newborn that has um, a, a not fully developed respiratory system, that is an emergency. That's something that needs to be dealt with immediately because a, a, maybe an adult, can, their system can handle that, but a baby, is, it's, you want to check it out right away. Okay. And it's something that's very easy to check out and diagnose. It's very easy to check out if the baby stops breathing throughout the night and deal with that problem. So you don't want to leave it un untreated even because we have the solution for it. So, and, and obviously, definitely with infants, you want to put them on, on their back in addition. Yes? Is there a genetic component to that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But um, I want to say with sleep apnea, I think one every 25 males have it, but I'm not 100% sure. For some reason, I remember that statistic. Okay, um, sleep state misperception is when people actually report they have insomnia, but really they were asleep. Like I have friends who complain, oh my God, I could, or you know, I didn't sleep all night, but really they were really asleep. They just overestimated, um, or sorry, underestimated how long it took them to fall asleep or how long they've been asleep. We all do that. 
Okay, um, SID, oops, or sudden infant death. Um, um, here you go for your question. Um, that can happen from sleep apnea, um, and because again they have an immature respiratory system, uh, you want to make sure to put them on their back, and it's something you want to check out obviously right away. Okay, but putting them on their back um, is going to help if that does happen because they're not mature enough to pick up their neck to breathe. They don't have the muscle strength there. Okay. Here's a baby. Put the baby on its back. <laughs> not on its stomach, even though it's more soothing for the baby and they go to sleep much faster on their stomach. Um, don't do that. Okay, <laughs> sleeping pills. Um, how sleeping pills work basically is that they bind to GABA, which is inhibitory, so they can put the brain to sleep. Now, the quality of sleep you get with sleeping pills is not the same thing as natural sleep. And you develop tolerance to sleeping pills very fast, and you can't live on them forever because they become ineffective. Okay? And it also um, changes your sleep patterns. And when you wake up from them, you actually you can, it can, you can still be disoriented for the following day. So I don't advise if you're taking a sleeping pill and you're driving the next day, you might actually be more drowsy than typically you would be if you actually had a natural night's sleep. So if you do have insomnia, you want to treat the reasons behind the insomnia and not the symptomatic or the symptoms of whatever you have, anxiety or depression. Okay, because by no means is this going to be a permanent solution. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions on sleep before we go on to the next chapter?